So, and we proceed. So let me again uh, start with the space of configurations. So I take a uh, usually locally compact, uh, locally compact separable metric space. And then uh, the space of configurations on E is the set of subsets without accumulation points as just as yesterday. And so this set has a Borel structure induced by occupation numbers as we discussed yesterday. So I write hash A of X for A Borel in E, A in E bounded Borel, bounded Borel. Uh, so is the number of particles, number of particles of X in E of particles of X in A. So these functions considered as random variables define the Borel structure. In fact, uh, one can also say that uh, the, this X can be equivalently thought as a Radon measure, eta x, which is just sum over delta x, x and x. So this is a purely atomic Radon measure. And of course, the space of Radon measures carries a topology, the vague topology. And uh, uh, the Borel structure here, given by these numbers, is the same as the Borel structure induced by the vague topology and the standard references for this kind of result is uh, the beautiful book of Daly via Jones on point processes. Okay, so this is the number of particles in of X in A. Uh, joint distributions of these quantities determine the measure. This can be seen as a definition uh, of what it is a measure on the space of configurations. And in particular, as we discussed uh, yesterday, if I have uh, disjoint sets, disjoint bounded barrels, uh, then I can consider uh, the corresponding generating function. So I can consider exponential sum zi ai. So, and it is easy to observe that this, so i from 1 to l, that this is indeed a multiplicative functional. So as I said uh, last time, uh, it is interesting, it is useful to consider not only additive functionals, but in fact multiplicative functionals on the uh, space of configurations. So uh, such, multiplicative function, such a multiplicative functional is well defined if the support of G minus one is compact because in this case uh, the product only includes uh, finitely many multiples and just uh, therefore since this is indeed multiplicative functional uh, specifying uh, specifying the uh, uh, values of the uh, specifying the expectations of all multiplicative functionals defines uh, a Borel measure uniquely. And so uh, now an alternative definition of a determinantal point process, which is uh, similar but in many ways more convenient, is that again the space E carries a measure, so mu mu is a sigma finite measure on E. So again. Uh, it is useful to think just that uh, E is R or C or, or the disk uh, and mu is just the Lebesgue measure. This is the, our, all our examples will be of this type. And then I consider a locally trace class operator, locally trace class operator on. So in other words, an operator given by a kernel locally trace class operator acting in L2, in L2, e. mu, 
And uh, uh, so it's an operator given by a kernel, pi f is integral pi x y f of y d mu of y. An operator admitting a kernel and the kernel, so locally trace class means that the, cur the, the trace of the kernel, trace of the kernel surrounded by an indicator of a bounded set is indeed finite, so B bounded by L. So much in the way we saw in the talks of Estelle. Uh, so, and uh, just of X, and here we have integral over E. And then a point process is called determinantal if the expectation of Psi G is equal to determinant one plus G minus one pi, if there exists such a kernel. So there is a little, so I want to write it like this, and in fact, you'll see in a moment why it is useful for me to write it like this, but in fact, if I want, uh, this determinant would be then the Hilbert Kalman determinant. If I want to have the usual, uh, if I want to have the usual uh, Fredholm determinant, then I have to write one plus G minus one, Pi, and I put on the other side the indicator function of B, where, where B is the support of G minus one. So, like this. So, and this is, uh, uh, so a point process is called determinantal if this holds for any G. For any G. So, for any G. This is the key property defining a determinantal point process. So, it is clear from what has been said so far that. Uh, G is a function. G is a function. G is a function on, on E. G is a function on E. Let's say bounded. Bounded and distinct from a measurable bounded barrel and, and distinct from one only on a compact subset. Yes? Yes, does it make sense, Tamara? Yes? So it is clear from what has been said so far that such a definition defines the point process uniquely because indeed it defines all the joint distributions of all the occupation numbers. Uh, Pierre will do the exercises and uh, you can quickly do on your own. It's equivalent to the definition with correlation functions. It's, uh, it's called uh, uh, representing a determinant as a series in terms of traces. So it's equivalent to definition with uh, correlation functions, and the question arises, do such processes exist? For what kernels, for what kernels do such processes exist? This question in full generality remains open. In fact, there are examples of kernels for which uh, we do not, uh, for which we do not have a suitable theory. So uh, let me very briefly say that for uh, such examples as the Dyson Brown in motion, Dyson Brown in motion sampled at several distinct moments of time gives a det multi time determinantal point process, but there doesn't exist a general theory of, for such kernels. So uh, we, we have a large class of examples, but there does not exist a general theorem which uh, guarantees existence of such determinantal point processes. Nonetheless, there does exist a very beautiful uh, general theorem, so with a beautiful history also. So it was, uh, it was started by a French physicist Odile Maquis, she works at Saclay, Odile Maquis, who gave this definition in 1975. So, and she proved the first version of a theorem, in fact, she proved the theorem that if pi is self-adjoint, and a strict contraction, so that's what she proved, strict contraction, then this measure exists. Okay, let me, let me introduce, let me introduce one piece of notation. I will denote uh, the determinantal measure, I will denote P corresponding to pi. And as I said yesterday, the very, no, no, the very notation, P pi, determinantal point process, the very notation is subtle in the sense that while pi, of course, uniquely determines p pi, it is not clear to what extent the measure determines the kernel. That remains an open problem. So, okay, so Dilmaki proved that if pi is self-adjoint positive contraction, then p pi exists. 
This is lovely, but doesn't cover examples. So in examples like the examples we discussed last time, for example, the discrete sign process, or another example which appeared so many times that, uh, let me just write it, the continuous sign kernel of Dyson, the continuous sign kernel of Dyson, which again, uh, just as last time, is uh, the Fourier projection. I take the Fourier transform now on R, restrict to minus pi pi and take the inverse Fourier transform. So there are also similar examples of the Henkel transform and so on, we'll see this later. Uh, however, these examples correspond to projections rather than to strict contractions. And in fact, this took 25 years and was done by Alexander Borisovich Soshnikov in the year 2000 and also uh, independently and simultaneously by Shirai and Takahashi in Japan. So, and this is the uh, Maki-Soshnikov theorem. This is the Maki-Soshnikov theorem. It exists, and as I said, it is unique uh, tautologically. So, and it is a general, uh, a general statement which covers by far most, even if not all, examples. So it doesn't cover the multi-time examples for which we lack a clear general understanding. And as I said, Last time, uh, and as it has emerged in many uh, courses, the, the course of John and the course of Brian, uh, uh, so their uh, determinant point process have a cousin, Pfaffian point processes, where the determinant is replaced by Pfaffian, but there does not exist a general theorem of this type of Pfaffian point process, or rather there exist some theorems of Kargin, but they are disjoint from examples. So the sign process has a Pfaffian cousin, and there is a very clear algorithm for forming a Pfaffian kernel and all the determinant processes essentially, or many of the determinant processes we discussed and will discuss have a Pfaffian cousin, but we don't have proof, we don't have a reason for existence of this Pfaffian. We don't have a general result for existence of such Pfaffian point processes. This remains an open problem uh, to, uh, to which there doesn't, it, it doesn't seem clear how to approach it. At the same time, the Makisoshnikov theorem can be proved in one line, and I, let me sketch this proof. So first take a finite range projection. First take a finite, so proof sketch. Uh, so first take a finite range projection. First take, okay, first take rank one projection. Rank one projection. So if I take rank one projection, then one can see from the definition that it's a process, so it's projection a function, it's a process which has only one particle, and the, the, the distribution of the particle is precisely the square of the function in the range. Okay, take finite range projection. It's the same, it, it's a process uh, supported on uh, k, uh, k particle configurations, and uh, the, uh, the weight of each configuration is clearly given by the formula. It will be the, the corresponding determinant of the wave functions of the orthonormal, of the orthonormal basis of the projection. And then take the weak limit, end of proof. So, uh, okay, so uh, now uh, the, uh, as I said, this gives a very wide, class of determinantal point processes, but uh, my aim here is to concentrate rather on specific examples and on properties of the specific examples and uh, let us uh, for some time stay with the sign process or if you prefer the discrete sign process from last time, so S alpha XY is the discrete sign process. I change notation slightly from last time, but very slightly where here, uh, where, so it's the same, but on the uh, circle. Please observe that uh, there is, uh, so here x, y in z, and here x, y in r. So please observe that the continuous sign process is only one. I can put an alpha here, but it will be killed by homotity. But of course, in discrete case, there are no homotities, and there, there is a whole family of uh, there is a whole family of uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, whole family of uh, discrete sign processes. Discrete sign processes. Uh, 
Okay, so and I want to discuss the properties of these sign processes. Uh, let me start with the sign process, but in fact, many of the results I will dis I, I'm discussing will be much more general. So let me say that there is a central limit theorem, which for the central limit theorem, which for the uh, uh, for uh, the dis uh, for the sign process, for the sign process, it was obtained by Kostin and Lebovitz, and in full generality uh, by Alexander Soshnikov. So in full generality. So and the central limit theorem says, uh, let me formulate it in uh, uh, let me formulate it for just for the sign process at this time. But in fact, it's much more general. So uh, the central limit theorem says that the number of particles in the interval from zero to t, well, minus obviously t in our, in our, uh, <clears throat> in our uh, convention, uh, the intensity of the sign process is just equal to one. Over the variance, the square root of the variance of this converges to the, stand uh, converges to the standard normal distribution. So this is uh, the central limit theorem of Kostin and Lebovitz, and uh, the theorem of Soshnikov just gives a general, very general result. So for any additive statistics, so I consider it multiplicative statistics, but it's uh, also very useful to consider additive statistic, additive statistics. So just the sum of values of a function. So just the additive statistics minus its expectation and over its variance. So f epsilon, f epsilon, let me, I, I will explain in a moment, over the square root of the variance, s f epsilon, converges to the standard, no, converges to the standard normal distribution. So, and uh, here, what is f epsilon, f, f, f epsilon of x? is f epsilon x. And the main, the only assumption here provided, assumption is that variance of a, 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 f epsilon goes to infinity, goes to infinity as epsilon goes to zero. So this is the only assumption. So in fact, it's completely general. In fact, it's completely general. Uh, just any determinant open process induced by projection. Any determinant determin open process induced by projection. It's completely general. And the proof of Soshnikov, so, uh, so Kostin Lebovitz proved it for the sign process, and Soshnikov proved it in full generality. And then uh, uh, the proof of uh, Soshnikov, uh, which is quite complicated, the proof of Soshnikov was very considerably simplified by half uh, uh, Virak uh, Peres Krishnapur. Who, who, by the way, have a beautiful survey on determinant point processes, and uh, who derived this theorem in a very beautiful one-page way from the central limit theorem for independent arrays. In fact, by observing that if I take a projection, or even rather than a projection, if I take pi to have finite trace, so let pi have finite trace, say, half uh, Peres uh, Virak Krishnapur. Uh, uh, so let it have finite trace. It has then eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Then I can consider a Bernoulli scheme which samples eigenvectors according to eigenvalues. And then uh, in finite dimensional case, this comes down to, uh, uh, so there are just finitely many particles. And then with the sampling, I, I'm reduced to central limit theorem for arrays. So there is, as I said, there is a one page proof uh, of this, which maybe more details can be done in exercises. So uh, let me <clears throat> let me just say, uh, without formulating it precisely at the moment, uh, maybe we formulate it later. That there is also an analog of this. Uh, there is also so uh, in uh, theory of dynamical systems, uh, together with the central limit theorem, there is often also. Uh, Donsker invariance principle, so uh, for example, trajectories of chaotic dynamical systems which obey the central limit theorem of Sinai, they also often obey the Donsker invariance principle, namely they're approximated by trajectories of the Brownian motion. But in fact, here, the Donsker invariance principle does not hold, does not hold, and in fact, there is a functional central limit theorem which was obtained in joint work with uh, Andrei Dymov, 
so enjoy to work with Andrei Dimov, but just uh, it's completely different from Brownian motion. So here, if I put a T, if I consider the additive statistic zero T, T where T in uh, zero one, then it is possible to study uh, this, the distribution of this in the space of continuous functions, it is possible to obtain limit theorems of weak type, but they are very different from the Donsky invariance principle. And I'm saying this because now I want to explain why. Why, what is the impo very important difference between, let's say, a sequence of independent trials and a determinant point process. And the important difference is the very slow growth of this variance. So for a sequence of independent trials, assuming for something like Poisson process, this variance would grow linearly. On the other hand, for determinantal point processes, this variance grows logarithmically, and there is a very uh, simple reason for that, and I will write this. Variance of SF, this is a beautiful observation, and I'm not sure who made it first. So variance of SF can be computed as, as, in fact, a Sobolev norm. Sobolev norm. So uh, the same Sobolev one-half norm that appeared in the uh, uh, course of Estelle. So the one-half Sobolev norm. Here we go. X, Y, square, d mu X, d mu Y. This is a beautiful and very simple computation. And uh, in very, in very uh, informal way, one can summarize the proof of Soshnikov's theorem by saying that, well, one can see that already in, in, in the term for variance, there, are, there is quite a number of cancellations. So the variance, variance of an additive statistic is quite small. And so uh, Soshnikov computes high accumulants, high accumulants of additive statistics, and manages to bound them, in, in fact, in terms of variance of the function f and of the variance of powers of the function f. And uh, 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 just by using uh, various commutation relations for the, for the cumulant. And uh, just uh, this allows him to say that the other cumulants go to zero, because the variance is quite small. The variance is quite small. The variance, essentially, Again, I'm giving a caricature of uh, Soshnikov's proof. Essentially, these quantities do not grow if I consider powers. They grow very little if I consider powers. So the cumulant is dominated by corresponding power of the variance, which precisely means that the random variables converge to the normal distribution and precisely explains why I need this assumption that the variance go to infinity. And another subject which I just touch uh, at this time uh, is that it's a very interesting case when variance does not go to infinity. So here it is clear that if f belongs to the Sobolev space one half, it is essentially tautological that if f belongs to Sobolev space one half, then the variance of SF is finite. Again, let, for concreteness, let us think of the sign process, but in fact, uh, most of what I say holds for a much wider class of determinant process. I should say that our functional central limit theorem is only proof for the sign process, whereas we believe it should hold uh, in, in much greater generality. So the variance is finite, and there is a very beautiful uh, central limit theorem of Johansson, which shows that in this case, the quantities SF epsilon minus ESF epsilon for the sign process still do converge to the normal Gaussian. And in, again, saying this very informally, this can be seen as a corollary of the Sego theorem, which we saw in the courses, uh, which we saw in the courses of Estelle and of Alexander Ritz. So this can be seen as a corollary of the Sego theorem. In fact, the Sobolev norm in the Sego theorem is the term that guarantees convergence to the normal distribution. So, but, in what generality this type of result holds is very unclear. So, so this one, this one, <laughs> this, this one, this one. The key is, the the well, yes, here it's, here it's, so here, uh, please observe, here I'm dividing by a constant, by what, by, okay, let me, let, to make the difference clear, let me, 
let me write it like this. Okay, so without normalization, so the cancellations among particles are so precise that without normalization, I have the central limit theorem. This is a very beautiful result of Johansson. So without normalization, yes, here it is with normalization. And it holds in vast generality, whereas here it is without normalization and it is only established in very specific situations such as the sign process. Okay, so I have explained that, so my point here was that while determinantal point processes satisfy the central limit theorem, uh, in fact, they're very different from a sequence of independent trials in that the particles know a lot about each other. The particles, the interaction between particles is extremely long range. And in fact, this phenomenon is very well illustrated by the rigidity of Gauche and Perez. Rigidity. So for determinantal point processes. So, and the statement of the gauche perez rigidity theorem uh, at first seems quite counterintuitive. So let me start with the discrete sign process uh, just for concreteness. Uh, gauche and Perez started with the continuous sign process. So, uh, so I have uh, my measure on the space of binary sequences. And uh, I know all the sequence except the position at zero. So I know, oh, I know, I know this. I know this. And I'm asking myself this. So the rigidity of Gauche and Perez says that in fact I can based on the information that I have, I can determine this value. So let me formulate this precisely. It might seem counterintuitive. What does it mean? Of course, I can change this value at will. It means that there exists, there exists a function. There exists a function of omega n, n not equal to zero. Let me choose a different letter, psi. Yes? Such that omega zero is equal to psi of omega n, n not equal to zero. Almost surely. S, P, S, so I'm considering the sign process at this moment. P, S, almost surely. P, S, almost surely. And in fact, while Gauche and Perez don't seem to have been aware of it, so this theorem, in fact, follows from a 1941 theorem of Kolmogorov. So who considers the following problem? Uh, just uh, the he considers Kolmogorov a stationary process, a stationary process. This was, again, uh, by the way, a line of investigations that started with Sigio, with the uh, paper from the Austrian trenches from 1915, which we saw the other day. So, uh, so Kolmogorov considers the uh, stationary process Xi n. Stationary process Xi n, stationary in the wide sense. Stationary in the wide sense. So just, if you wish, a sequence of vectors in a Hilbert space such that the inner product xi k, xi l is only a function of the difference only depends on k minus l. So just, as I say, a sequence of vectors xi k, vectors in Hilbert space. Vectors in a Hilbert space. Uh, it's interesting to point out that this paper was also written during the war. Uh, vectors in a Hilbert space in a Hilbert space. So, uh, okay. And so Kolmogorov asks, uh, asks, under what conditions does Xi naught belong to the span of Xi n and not equal to zero? So again, there, are all kinds of, there were all kinds of questions, interpolation, extrapolation, predicting the past from the future. So here it is, predicting the present given the past and the future. Predicting the present given the past and the future. And Kolmog, yes? It's not very clear to me what's happening there. So it's like a Maya diagram that you have and you yes. positions? Yes. And what does the psi include? I'm answering this question right now. Oh, because there are vectors here. 
I'm coming to this in a moment. I'm coming to this in a moment. That's quite that's quite uh, that's quite precise. I'm coming to this in a moment. Yes. So uh, I'm coming to this in a moment. So, okay, but is the statement clear of this? Of, of the is the statement of is the statement of the theorem clear? Yes. Oh, may, yes okay. Uh, the connection. I'm coming to this in a moment. Maybe I should have let let me change notation once again. This will be zeta. It's not the same sign. Okay. So xi k are vectors in a Hilbert space, and uh, I'm uh, Kolmogorov asks uh, whether. Uh, whether xi naught belongs to the closed span of xi n uh, when n is different from zero. So, and in fact, Kolmogorov gives an answer, gives an answer to this in terms of the spectral density of the process. So if this quantity only, only depends on the difference, then in fact it's a theorem of uh, Herglotz and Hinchin that uh, this is integral e to the i theta k minus L with respect to some spectral measure, and uh, again, the only case of interest for us is when the spectral measure has a spectral density, because if it doesn't, then this holds. So rho of theta d theta. So this is just a situation in which we find ourselves. So the inner product is the inner product of the vectors, if it only depends on the difference, is in fact the integral of a trigonometric polynomials. In other words, there is a spectral isometry between xi n and the sequence of trigonometric polynomials e to the i and theta, but considered, considered of course, on the circle, but with the measure rho of theta d theta. There we go. So not just with uh, Lebesgue measure, with some other measure. So this is the spectral isometry, spectral isometry. Uh, this always exists for a stationary process. And so uh, Kolmogorov's criterion is that this holds if and only if the integral, the integral of d theta over rho of theta is infinite. So the spectral density has to take value zero at zero, and the integral has to be infinite, and then it belongs. So how does Kolmogorov prove his theorem? He proves his theorem in the following way. He considers, and now I'm answering your question, Annie. So he considers uh, a sequence of additive statistics, a sequence of additive statistics, alpha k, uh, xi k, and he chooses them in such a way, so this is a sequence of additive statistics, let's say, Sn, alpha k, n, xi k, so sum over k, and he chooses them in such a way that the that the, in Hilbert space, the norms go to zero. And, and of course, alpha zero is equal to one. Alpha zero, n equals one. So the norms go to zero, alpha zero, n equals one. He chooses the sequence of additive statistics using this condition. Uh, and uh, then it is clear that if I have such additives, if I have such sequence of statistics, then xi zero is indeed in the linear span of the other xi k just by definition, because these ones go to zero. So xi zero can be expressed through the other ones. So then the question can be asked how to compute this. So now, now I come to the connection and I prove uh, the gaussian pairs theorem. So first of all, what are the xi k? Well, the xi k, it's clear what they are. The xi k, xi k is equal to zero if I have a particle and to one if I have a hole. So these are just, so it's just natural, but it's just natural, uh, natural occupation, occupation number, zero and one, yes? So uh, uh, now uh, the question is, what about spectral density? And it's always so pleasant when you don't have to do some work because it's been done for you by others. In fact, John computed for us the spectral density the other day. Here it is. So the spectral density is this. So, and it is immediate to check that this integral is in fact infinite, being the integral of one over x. Uh, so uh, the uh, gaussian pairs theorem is proved completely. So the uh, xi naught is, in fact, a linear combination of uh, xi n's, and so the zeroth particle, uh, the zeroth particle, the position of the particle at zero is determined by uh, whether, excuse me, whether there is or there is not a particle at zero is determined by the particles elsewhere. 
So uh, let me point out that Gosh and Perez did a very similar argument. However, without assuming stationarity, without assuming stationarity, they considered sequence of additive statistics, considered sequence of additive statistics, uh, and then uh, proved uh, uh, rigidity, proved rigidity for the signed process. Let me point out also that uh, the, so Gosh and Perez did the sign process, but in fact for other standard determinantal point processes from random matrix theory, so like the airy process, which uh, Brian mentioned for the process with the Bessel kernel, which I will mention a little bit later, and many other processes, this can be done using the Gosh and Perez argument. This, uh, has been done in 2016, and uh, just also for stationary processes with, in joint work with uh, Jan Shishiu and Jan Dabrowski, uh, we did, uh, uh, from 2015, we studied more general stationary processes, so it is already clear from what has been said so far that if I have a stationary kernel, then this stationary kernel would in fact be given by a Fourier multiplier, but possibly by a Fourier multiplier on, not on an interval, on a more general set. And so we have, a, so given a determinant point process with the kernel with a more general set, uh, we have a condition which roughly says that the uh, that the um, boundary of the set is sufficiently uh, regular, which is a sufficient condition uh, ensuring rigidity, which is a sufficient condition ensuring linear rigidity. Let me also say that this very naive mechanism uh, which we call linear rigidity, because in fact here uh, the, uh, the, the, the question whether there is or there is not particle at zero is determined in a linear way starting from the particles in other positions. Uh, so this remains, as far as I know, the only mechanism for rigidity. It is possible, it is very possible to give examples when this, the Kolmogorov criterion does not work. Let me give such an example right away. Take uh, the sign process and consider it's tensor square. Consider the same sign process, but in R2 rather than in R1. So just a, a Fourier, Fourier multiplication by characteristic function of the square rather than the interval. Then uh, the Kolmogorov criterion is the same, but except this corresponding integral over the two-dimensional torus will converge rather than diverge, and so linear rigidity does not hold. But the question whether rigidity in general does or does not hold, we don't know. So there, surprisingly, there doesn't seem to be a mechanism for proving or disproving rigidity other than this very naive linear argument. So now, uh, the question of rigidity, and now uh, just I am uh, returning to the uh, action of the symmetric group which I mentioned last time. So I have, yes, exactly, yes. Uh, so, uh, so the question of, <clears throat> uh, the question of rigidity uh, naturally brings forward the question that I would call the question of quasi-symmetries. So the question of the action of symmetric groups. So let me explain myself in detail. Uh, I consider, uh, let's start with the discrete sign process, though in fact uh, what I'm saying is much more general. So it is clear from what has been said so far, and using the Kolmogorov criterion, so uh, just that if I take not just particle at zero, but I take any bounded interval, any bounded interval, so the number of particles in this bounded interval, the number of particles in this bounded interval is determined by the exterior. Is determined by the exterior. By the exterior. I think I should erase something. <coughs> is determined by the exterior. So, and the question, so the number of particles determined by the exterior. And a natural question arises, is something else also determined by the exterior, not just the number of particles? So are there other invariants? So the exterior tells me that there are maybe no particles or maybe one particle and so on. But does it tell me anything else? And so the main result that I will formulate now is that in fact, 
It does not, so let me formulate it for a discrete sign process, but in fact the result holds in much greater generality. And a first particular case was established by Grigory Elshansky uh, in the context of the gamma kernel, uh, another discrete kernel, uh, giving rise to a determinantal point process coming as a limit from Young diagrams. And just, uh, but let me concentrate on the sign process, and in fact, then I will explain in what generality the result holds. So, <clears throat> I am interested, uh, so again, I'm, I take, <clears throat> I take uh, the bounded interval, a bounded interval, so, I fix the exterior, I fix the exterior, fix the exterior. So as has been already said, uh, the number of particles is hereby fixed. Let's say there are three particles. So the, let us consider all possible arrangements of three particles in these positions. So the question is, do all these possible arrangements, do all of them have positive probability? Equivalently put, does the action of the infinite symmetric group, so I have uh, uh, my measure P S alpha. So the infinite symmetric group S infinity acts on the space Z by permutations. So, and of course acts on this measure as well. So the question is, it obviously does not preserve this measure. In fact, uh, all S infinity invariant measures are the Bernoulli measures. This is the theorem of Definetti. So, but, uh, does it, does it preserve the class of this measure? Is this measure quasi-invariant under the action of the infinite symmetric group? And the answer is yes, it is, and uh, this is uh, a result that's been published in 2018. So just, uh, uh, and <clears throat> the, let me formulate it uh, in the following way. So, it, uh, uh, so I will write, the Radon-Nicodym derivative just for one permutation. So I have one permutation. So let, let us consider that I fix everything except two positions. So, or actually, it does, I, they don't have to be adjacent. So two positions, so here, P and Q, P and Q. So in one of the positions, so obviously if both have particle and or both have hole, if I interchange them, nothing much changes. So one of them has particle, I have particle at P and hole at Q. So this is all fixed. So I have the corresponding transposition, uh, transposition, the element of the infinite symmetric group. So, and I transpose these elements and I'm asking what happens to the measure and I'm telling you. So the answer is, Uh, in fact, it is a multiplicative functional. So the Radon-Nicodym derivative, so the measure acted on by the permutation over the measure itself, is a product. So, uh, yes, x minus q, x minus p square, taken, there is a constant, a simple constant depending on only on P and Q. Let me not write it just for brevity. It's very simple in terms of the kernels at P and Q. So just, uh, um, excuse me, just uh, X in X and uh, uh, I take the product in principal value. I take the product in principal value, and no, I made a mistake, there is no constant actually, no. The constant will arise at a different point. No, that's it, excuse me. So I take the product in principal value, what do I mean? Obviously this product diverges absolutely, it diverges absolutely. Why does it diverge absolutely? Because in fact, if one thinks about it, I have the harmonic series here, and the harmonic series diverges absolutely. At the same time, the harmonic series converges in principal value, and so does this product. And this is why I have this formula, because one can see that the function one over x 
Please observe that I don't care at this moment, I don't care about singularity at zero for the function one over x. In continuous case, it will be important, but in this case, it's not. It's a technical simplification. So the function one over x, considered as a function in z, so no singularity at zero, the function one over x is not integrable. So let us write the expectation for the additive statistics. The expectation for the additive statistics is just the integral of f. So this integral of f is not defined. Uh, f, uh, so it's not integrable, it's not integrable. Nonetheless, and now I'm saying something that is not possible, but I'll make it precise, nonetheless, it, it, the variance is finite. So it is not integrable, but it is square integrable. Such a thing is not possible, but it is, uh, how do you say, it is square integrable in the, se in what sense is it square integrable? It is square integrable, uh, how do I say? Uh, that this formula can be understood here. This formula can be understood uh, again in principal value. So uh, the, how to explain myself? Uh, this formula ensures integrability for functions f, uh, for functions f, uh, for which this integral converges absolutely. At the same time, if this integral converges only in principal value, this formula still can be proved by limit transition, but by limit transition in L2, which of course is stronger than limit transition in L1. We are on a probability space. So, so I'm trying to say that it is not immediately clear that this function is even integrable. So uh, looking just at the formula, it's not clear at all. But it is in fact integrable because it is it is square integrable, and it is square integrable, well, it is clear that uh, 1 over x minus 1 over y square uh, such integral converges because it uh, just, it's immediate, uh, such, such, integral, such integral converges. So, this multiplicative functional converges in absolute value, so it's a, a multiplicative functional which is, uh, there is a process of regularization, so the determinants which I had on this board and I erased, the determinants for this multiplicative functional must be defined uh, using regularization technique, it must be the Hilbert-Karleman determinants, but nonetheless this formula holds and is very general, so uh, for similar formula with minor modifications. So observe, by the way, this formula does not depend on alpha. The right-hand side does not depend on alpha. So the uh, similar formula with minor modifications holds for all kernels, discrete or continuous, it doesn't matter, for all kernels of uh, integrable type. So kernels which have this form. Uh -huh. Yes, okay, uh -huh. for kernels which have this form, and in the one minute that I have, I will very quickly explain the mechanism, the mechanism which underlies the validity of this formula. So it is complicated, it is complicated to prove, complicated to prove that two measures are equivalent. Even for Bernoulli measures, if you have two Bernoulli measures, there is a not very simple theorem of Kakutani which shows when two Bernoulli measures are equivalent. It is absolutely not clear, and this is, uh, this is from where Olshansky started, it's absolutely not clear when two determinantal measures are equivalent, when they're different by multiplication by function. At the same time, one can give a very simple answer to the question when two determinantal measures are different by multiplicative functional. I will formulate this question, and uh, uh, then I, I will stop there. So I will formulate this, the answer, then I will stop there. So if I have, it's a very simple remark, which is one page long uh, from 2012, and just, uh, uh, I leave verification as an exercise, so we can return to it uh, on Thursday, but uh, it just explains, thing, explains why such results can be proved. So, let me consider a kernel pi, which is a kernel of projection onto some subspace L. So let me consider function g as above. So then I claim that the measure psi g, where psi g, let us recall, is multiplicative functional. Is multiplicative functional. So psi g times is, in fact, again determinantal, and with a kernel pi g, 
where pi g is projection onto square root of g l. Projection onto square root of g l. So, and let me just illustrate, uh, illustrate this by a very simple example. Imagine you have an orthogonal polynomial ensemble. So if you multiply orthogonal polynomial ensemble, so what is orthogonal polynomial ensemble? It's square of the van der Mond times some, some product of variables. If you multiply this orthogonal polynomial ensemble by multiplicative functional, it is tautologically equivalent to multiplying the weight, to multiplying the weight by this multiplicative functional, to multiplying the weight. So, which precisely is the same thing as multiplying the range, the range being polynomials times square of the weight, multiplying the range by the root of the weight. So the statement is that this holds, this holds in full generality of determinantal point processes. This statement is not about orthogonal polynomial sums, it's in full generality of determinant point process. If I have a determinant point process, uh, which is just given by projection, I multiply it by multiplicative functional, uh, then uh, in fact I obtain projection on this range. And uh, just this, by the way, is one line, one line verification from definition, which I'll leave as exercise until tomorrow. And from this, uh, from this, by uh, uh, studying the action of the symmetric group, uh, one obtains this result. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Okay, so let's thank Alexander again.